Hello, and welcome to our Facebook Live event. We're excited to have you here. You made it. In today's show, we will teach you techniques to improve your art, and we'll share fun facts about wildlife as you draw. The wildlife species featured in today's art tutorial will be the beaver. The beaver is a species featured in this year's Game and Fish Collectible Stamp Art Contest, which is now in its 40th year. And new to this year is a contest especially designed for youth artists. So while today's tutorial will be relevant to any artist looking to improve their um, art techniques, uh, we hope there are a few youth artists joining us here today. And by the end of the tutorial, eligible youth artists will be able to produce an original piece of artwork featuring the beaver that can be submitted to our Youth Conservation Stamp Art Contest. Uh, winners will have a chance to win cash prizes, so stay tuned for more details on how to enter. But first, I'd like to introduce two special guests that we have today. Um, the first guest is Jane Lavina. She is the Sugden Chief Curator of Education at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming. Over the past 32 years, Jane has built an, an award-winning program reaching over 10,000 adults and children annually. This is one of those events, and uh, we're excited to have you be a part of that number. She and her team of educators make fine art relevant and accessible to diverse audiences. And recent accolades include three film festival awards for the museum's educational video series, Bison Casts. So if you get the chance, uh, that's something we hope you check out as well. And in conjunction with her work at the museum, Jane has served on panels and has taught workshops to promote art education in Wyoming and nationally. And then our other guest is Jerry Altermatt. Jerry is the Cody Region Terrestrial Habitat Biologist with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And so Jerry will be kind of tackling the biology of beavers and Jane will be showing us um, some of those art tips and tricks uh, to help us draw an award-winning beaver, hopefully. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Jane on and uh, she will take it away. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Like Chris said, I'm at the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Jackson, Wyoming, and I'm sitting in our museum classroom right now. Behind me is a mural painted by a local artist named Greta Gretzinger. So we're going to be making some art too today, but we're going to start by looking at uh, artwork from the museum's collection, specifically so about some beaver art. So the first one we're gonna check out here is a, it's a bronze sculpture. It's by an artist named George Balsiar. And I know that we are not creating sculpture today, but I wanted us to look at this one because it is such a great um, example for showing the beaver's anatomy. In other words, the body parts. It's wonderful for showing that kind of rounded, smooth shape of the, of the torso or the main center part of the body. It's great at showing that paddle shaped tail off the beaver that's on the left side as you're looking at the image, as well as you can see what one of the back um, feet or rather paws looks like. And the tiny little ears, notice I, what I really want you to be doing here is looking at the body shapes and the the different parts of the anatomy. Can you see on the beaver on the right-hand side, the two little front legs kind of in this position? Can you see the tiny little ears? Can you see the position of the nose? I'm gonna let Jerry jump in now and talk to us about these unique features of the beaver on their anatomy and tell us why they look the way they do. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to be with you and hopefully share some fun and interesting facts about beavers. So the sculpture is actually, it's a pretty good uh, representation because one of the most interesting things about beavers is their tails, because no other animal in North America has a tail like that. And this sculpture, the perspective gives you the two really kind of important angles to see what a beaver's tail shape looks like. So as Jane said, you know, that one on the left has kind of a, you can see it's a wide paddle shape, almost like an oar, a canoe oar. 
And they're usually about that proportion. They're about, it varies from beaver to beaver. They're all a little bit different, but usually the width of their tail is a little less than half of the length of their tail. And that tail doesn't have any hair on it like the rest of them. That hair just abrupt, abruptly ends. And you can kind of see in that sculpture a line where the hair ends and that hairless, black, scaly looking tail starts. Um, the beaver on the right, you can see how thin that tail is. These are looking at a different angle. So it tapers from about two inches thick right up against the back, all the way down to about a quarter of an inch thick, which is you know smaller than the, the thickness of your pinky. And there, in the kind of note on this one is, you know, Jane said their, their, their body form is kind of short and stocky, almost like a, a football or a watermelon. But one thing to really note is where their hind feet are, especially the one on the right. So that hind foot is kind of right below the center of gravity. And when you see them on land, this is typically the posture that you'll see them in. They're kind of up on their hind feet and that frees up their front feet to do all kinds of things that we can talk about later. But in order to be able to use those front feet, they can't have you know, their weight too far forward or they need to put those feet down. So those hind feet are pretty much right underneath the main center of that ball of the beaver. So everything's kind of balanced this balance between you know, their head and their front feet and that tail also provides a balance. So they're able to kind of stay in that, that upright sitting position. I love how well you can see the difference in size between the what appear to be quite small front feet and then the quite big back feet. So yeah, that's something to remember when you're drawing. The yeah. feet are not the same size. Not at all. And they're, they're used totally different for a beaver. I mean, the hind feet are, they're mostly for power for swimming. And you can see in that sculpture that there's actually webs between the fingers, the digits on that hind foot. And you can't really see it on the front feet. They don't have webs, but um, they, they're only using their back feet when they're swimming. Their front feet are just kind of tucked up. Um, but just because they're small doesn't mean they're useless. They do a lot of things with their front feet. Nice. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is uh, another bronze sculpture by an artist from a long time ago, Zell. And what I think is interesting on this one, of course, the shape of the beaver is kind of hard to figure out what's going on. The other one was much better for that. But this one I love because it's showing it doing a natural behavior. It has a, a tree a stump from a tree that it has gnawed on to, to take down on the left. And it looks like it's maybe peeling some bark off of the tree and it's using its teeth. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about the teeth at this point too, how they use their teeth. But also let's talk about natural behaviors because what I find with the artwork here at our museum, the piece, some of the pieces that I like the best show the animal doing some kind of natural behavior. You know, whether it's a fox chasing a rabbit or whether it's a, a black bear catching fish uh, or a grizzly bear catching fish. Um, they're, they're interacting in some way with their environment, with other animals, um, doing some kind of natural behavior. So Jerry, could you talk about the natural behavior here and maybe some of the other types of behavior that you might see a, be a beaver doing? Yeah, so right here we see a beaver doing what beavers do a lot of. When you hear the term busy, of a be busy as a beaver, this is what they're talking about. I mean, they're chewing on wood for a couple of reasons. And you'll see on the left there, there's a, a stump that a beaver has chewed through. And a lot of times, you know, when we're in beaver country, that's the, the most telltale sign that beavers have been there is that chewed off tree, which might lead us to believe that they're eating wood. They're really not eating wood. They're just trying to bring that tree down because what they're really eating is the inner bark and the leaves and the really small twigs that they'll consume whole. But, you know, beavers, even when they're standing up like this one is, they're not very tall. And so they can't reach where most of the groceries are on a tree. And so 
you know, unlike a porcupine that can actually climb up into a tree and eat bark, beavers can't do that. They can't climb. So they're really unique in the animal world in that they actually bring the food to themselves. And that's why they're, they're chewing these trees down, to bring all that food down to where they can reach it. And a little bit about the teeth. And of course, you can't see the teeth there, but beavers have, just like you have incisors, your front two teeth, uh, beavers also have those, but they're really specialized. They're really long and they continue to grow throughout their entire lifetime. And like ours, they grow and they kind of stop. Beavers will continue to grow, but they're constantly worn off by chewing through wood and that actually keeps them sharp so that they can actually you know, cut right through that wood. And a beaver can cut you know, the, the, uh, a willow the size of your thumb, they can cut through in one bite. So those incisors are, are pretty darn sharp. Nice. Okay, so here's another uh, work of art. This one is a drawing by Charles Livingston Bull, who was an illustrator. He illustrated books and magazines, and he loved to do animals. And here you can see there are two beavers. The one on the left is carrying something that we think probably is mud. And I'm going to let Jerry in, in just a second tell us why a beaver might be carrying a ball of mud in its front paws. Um, the, uh, you can see the, um, the, the nice rounded shape over the back of the beaver on the right. I want you to really start to notice the shapes because when we start to draw, one of the first thing I tell people is, you know, what are the basic shapes? If I were gonna draw this beaver, I might start with a circle to show that back hindquarters of the beaver and then maybe an oval for the head. These are the things that we really look closely at. But let's talk about behavior for a little bit longer because the behavior here is interesting. What would you say, Jerry? What's it doing? Yeah, so earlier I said that those front feet are small, but they're definitely not useless. They use them for a lot of things. So they can use them to, to eat. So they'll grab, they'll actually take a hold of a willow or a cottonwood branch and they'll turn it just like you would a, a ear of a, a corn on the cob when you're eating it. Um, they're really dexterous. Their fingers are, are really um, a nimble. They can move them around really easily. Um, but this picture, this, this artist's rendition is showing something they do quite often when they're building a dam, which beavers are very well noted for, they'll use sticks and mud. And in order to get that mud there, they'll actually pick that mud up with their front feet and hold it up against their, their chin or their chest. And then they'll waddle from where they got the mud over to their dam. And it's almost kind of comical to watch them do that because they look really clumsy when they're on their hind feet, but they're actually quite good at doing that. So this is one of the ways that they use their front feet. They'll also use those front feet for digging, uh, for like digging out their, their dens. Um, and so, yeah, we, you know, looking at this, this drawing, uh, it appears to be mud because it's the same color that you see right below the beaver. And I'm assuming that's their dam. Um, when you look at a beaver dam, it's kind of equal parts, depending on where the dam is being built, but it's kind of equal parts mud and sticks. If it was just sticks, then the water would just kind of go right through it. So they need to have mud in there to seal it up. And we can talk a little bit later about why they might build a dam, but I think we'll just keep rolling right now. Okay. Here's another, uh, it's an illustration. It's a pr an old print by an artist named Carl Bodmer, who is a German artist. And the reason, this one is um, great for showing habitat. That's the reason we wanted to include this one. And when I say habitat, of course, I mean the home or the environment where the beaver lives. So whenever you see an artist creating a work of art about a beaver, usually they show the water because they're usually not far from water, whether that water is a river or a lake or a stream. Um, they like deep water. And I'm going to let Jerry get to that in just a little bit. But notice how the artist here is showing us not only the water, but is showing us a little bit of what the land looks like too, because a beaver spends part of its time in the water and part of its time on the land. They go back and forth. So I would recommend that when you're doing your work of art about the beaver, that you do the same, that you include the habitat by showing some water and some land. 
And of course, when you're showing the land, you want to be showing the correct plants and trees for what you might see growing next to uh, a lake or a stream. So in this one, it's a little hard to tell, but we know in Wyoming, where we see beavers next to rivers, we typically see cottonwood trees, we might see aspen trees, um, Definitely, you're, you're going to see maybe some sagebrush You might uh, up higher, but I, I meant to say willows down close, down low to where the water is. And then, you know, maybe there's some, some down trees, some that they've chewed down that they're dragging around to, um, to make their dam with. We talked about that a little bit. Would there be wildflowers? Yeah, oftentimes we do see wildflowers in the summertime on the side of the riverbanks. So what I want you to do is start to think about what trees, what plants have you seen growing next to rivers and streams? And Jerry, could you fill us in on more information about typical beaver habitat and what, what kinds of things you might add in the background of your drawing? Yeah, as Jane said, it's a beaver span kind of like half their time in the water and half the time out, but they have to have water. They're called a semi-aquatic animal, meaning they have to spend most of their time, or at least part of their time in the water. And we can talk a little bit about the vegetation. So beavers, they're always around water and the foods that they like to eat, the materials they like to build their dams from are also found near the water. And we call those areas riparian areas that a green vegetation that's associated with a stream or a river. And so, yeah, if you're drawing beaver habitat, those things have to be included. I mean, you don't want to draw a sagebrush plant right next to the water because sagebrush would be killed by that much water. You know, things like, you know, cottonwoods and, and willows and, and aspen and uh, water birch. You know, it might, you might be good to actually look up some of those plants and see what they look like because that's the kind of things you'd want to have in your drawing. And I'll have to show my ignorance here. This is actually the only artist I'd ever heard of in these. Um, I know a little something about Carl Bodmer, but um, he went up the Missouri River, which is in, in Northern Montana, Northern uh, North Dakota. And this is kind of interesting because when you look at this painting, you see in the background a beaver lodge. I think we all kind of know what a beaver lodge is. It's a mound of of sticks and mud, just like a dam is. They'll build it just like a dam. But when they're done, they'll actually chew a cavity out to hollow it out. And that's basically what they live in. And uh, this painting depicts the Missouri River. And what you'll notice is there's no dam there. So beavers don't always build dams. They don't always have to build a dam. And they could never build a dam across the Missouri River. So I mean, don't always think that you have to have a dam in a beaver setting because not all beavers need to or even can build a dam. And so Bodmer's got some vegetation in the background and, and I'm not sure how accurate he was trying to be here, but I, I really can't identify any of those plants there. But I think when you're, when you're drawing beaver habitat, you, you definitely want to have at least you know, cottonwoods, willows, or aspen. Those are the three favorite foods of beavers. Nice. Okay, this one we threw in because it, people who visit our museum, which hopefully if you have not yet had a chance to, you will visit our museum sometime. But that is a totem pole that is in our um, Sullivan Hall. It's our, it's our, where the admissions desk is. It's right near the museum's restaurant. So it's a, it's a great tall, huge tall um, carving out of a Western red cedar. And it's done by an indigenous person or a native person from a Northwest Coast tribe. His name is Marvin Oliver. And uh, in these traditional totem poles, they would include animals that were important to their family group or to the clan. And the beaver was one that was important. So it's a little hard to see, but right in the middle of what you're looking at there is the head of the beaver and then you can see the front paws clutching a stick. There's actually a stick in its mouth. And then what looks almost like a hat on top of the beaver's head is actually its tail flipped up over the back of its head. So you can see the tail, but look at the texture of that tail. I want Jerry, I would love it, Jerry, if you could talk just a little bit about 
you know, why their tail is that bumpy texture? What's going on there? Yeah, it almost looks like scales. I mean, the skin on their tail is is very leather-like. I mean, obviously, skin is leather when it's, when it's processed, but it really looks like it's tan leather. There's no hair on it, and there's fine scales, not quite as big as you would see in that picture. But that's what struck me about this this photo of this totem pole is is the pattern of those scales, and it, it's um, it's actually quite true. That's kind of what it looks like. This slide is, if you're planning to do a work of art that includes a beaver and enter it into the conservation contest, um, the one of the requirements or one of the things they're looking for is that it be realistic. In other words, the anatomy is correct, the colors of the fur are correct, which of course the artist has taken some freedom here with the colors, um, you know, it doesn't show a brown beaver. Their fur is brown. Of course, the color brown in real life can vary a little bit from dark, almost black, to a golden brown, to a reddish brown, which I guess is more common. But this artist has taken some artistic license, we call it, and they have, you know, abstracted the form and they've added their own colors, um, which is fun to do for all artists. But for this contest, we ask that you do realism. Realism means making it look like it looks in real life. Like these. <laughs> these are more realistic portrayals of beavers. Okay, I think what we're going to do next is we're going to look at some photographic references. So when an artist is getting ready to do a work of art, they will do one of two things. They will either, and sometimes they do both, oftentimes they do both. One would be to go out and really observe beavers in their natural habitat. Um, this is a little harder to do. Of course, we're not going to be able to do that during the hour that we are together. And the other way, and I actually, there are some artists who say you should never skip, skip that step. Uh, like Bob Kuhn, for example, he said, never, you know, skip that because if you are just using photographs for reference, you won't capture that life energy and the natural behaviors as well as if you're looking at them out in nature. But the second best thing is to look at photographs. And these photographs, I think Jerry has taken many of these photographs himself. Um, as you all are well aware, in, you know, with the computer and with internet, you can look up images of beavers really easily. You can check out books from your library. You can check out animal guide books. Um, but for this contest, one of the rules is that you create an original work of art. And I'm just gonna say a little bit about that right now. And then I'll say probably say more about it later. But original art is something you made yourself. And you, that means you can't copy another artist's work. It means you can't copy a painting from our museum or a sculpture from our museum. You might look at it for reference to understand what does that back foot look like? Where is the eye positioned? But you can't copy it exactly. Same goes for photographs. If you're looking at another person's photograph, they've made a lot of decisions. They've decided, you know, the pose, you know, the viewpoint, they've decided They've you know, gone to the work to go out there and capture that photo. So if it's a copyrighted photo, you cannot use it for reference. That would be against the rules. However, Jerry took this photo and he gave me permission as an artist to copy it and use it in my art. Um, you can also find copyright free references like Wiki Commons is one online. Whenever you choose to uh, use somebody else's photograph for reference, make sure it's not under copyright, or if it is, make sure you get permission from that photographer to use that. So thank you, Jerry, for letting all of us use your copyrighted work. Do you wanna talk about how you were able to capture these uh, photographic references for us? Sure, yeah, copy away. You got my permission. I did not get the permission of the beaver, but I'm pretty sure he's okay with you copying it as well. So this is a photo of 
a beaver that's actually in captivity. So we trap beavers, we live trap them, and then we move them because beavers are actually a tool to improve habitat because they build dams and they, they create ponds, they create wetlands. And so we live trap them and we try to trap an entire family, but that doesn't happen in one night. It might take two weeks. And so as we're trapping them, we need to have a place to put them. And so this picture is a beaver inside of uh, a holding facility, a place that we keep these beavers mounted on a trailer. And it's just a cage made out of aluminum that has all the things that a beaver needs. So on the left, you see water. It's just a big water tank that they can swim in and drink. And on the right side is a feeding platform and we give them uh, willows and cottonwoods every day. And then you can't really see it, it's kind of out of the picture, but there's a little artificial den, an artificial lodge that they can crawl into as well. Look at a couple of the other photographic references just so people can see um, you know, what might be a natural pose for a beaver. Jerry, you say they often sit like this, sitting on they, their tails. They do. Yeah. If we could, can we go back to that previous picture? I just want to note a couple of things here. So if you look at the tail of that beaver, you know, if we were to draw a tail of a beaver, we'd want it to make really look really perfect, nice, perfect form. But beaver tails are rarely like that, especially the older they get. So you'll notice on this beaver that the tip of that tail, kind of on the left side, there's a piece missing. And with almost every beaver, you're going to find something like this. And that's because beaver from different families occasionally fight. And they'll actually take a chunk out of their each other's tails. They'll bite their tails. And so almost every beaver that's more than a couple years old has some kind of scars on their tails. So that's just kind of interesting. And you know, always, the easiest way to tell one beaver from another is by looking at their tails. They're very individualistic. They're very, very unique. Another thing I like about these photos is they show you all the different positions the tail might be in. They don't have to stick straight out the back. They could be sitting on their tail, pointing forward, sticking out to the side like this one, all kinds. Or I don't know, Jerry, if they ever put them over their head like the totem beaver. I, I have never seen that, but okay. they quite often do this. And, and a lot of people, when they draw a beaver, they never think to draw a beaver doing this. But right. most of the time when they do sit, they do actually bring their tail up underneath themselves. So their tail is actually upside down and they'll sit on their tail. Yep. Especially so when you're wanted... doing what, what this guy is doing right now. So he's grooming himself. He's, okay. um, he's rubbing oil on his fur. And so when you look at a beaver, like this beaver probably just came out of the water and the fur looks very wet, but it's only wet on the outside. Underneath in their under fur, they're actually still pretty dry because they have an oil gland on their stomach, on their bottom side, that they'll put that oil on their hands, on their front feet, and they'll rub it all over their fur to keep that fur really oiled. And so it doesn't, you know, oil repels water. If something's oily, it really can't get that wet. And so that's what this beaver is doing. And usually when they do that, they do sit on their tails like this beaver is doing. I love that. Some of you might want to draw your beaver sitting on its tail. Okay, here's another great photographic reference. I, As someone who draws quite a bit, I kind of like it when I can find a profile. For whatever reason, if it's a person or an animal, I find the profile easier to draw than straightforward or you know, a three quarter view turning to the side. But again, notice the position of the front paws. Um, you know, they don't have to be down on the, on the ground or on the log. They could be up like that. They could be holding something like a little twig. They could um, take any number of uh, positions. I'm just checking this one out. Look at the one swimming on the upper right hand corner. Those are its front paws that you see up by its mouth. And it's probably holding something like a stick and swimming with the stick. Um, notice the uh, two on the bottom sitting on the log. That's a great position or a pose to choose for a work of art because that way you can show the tail position. You can show the, you know, the profile if you want. You can show the front feet and they're not getting lost in the water or in the grass. 
that's a we have quite a few works of art in our museum collection where the animal is shown standing on a log or on a rock like that so you can really see it well notice the swimming beaver it's pretty heavy they jerry is it because they're heavy that they sink down so low in the water and don't float up very high is that the reason they can kind of control that with the amount of air they put in their lungs, just like a submarine. I mean, if they, they breathe a lot of air in, they are more buoyant, but they can breathe, you know, push that air out of their lungs and then they'll sink down. Um, it's kind of fun to watch them do that. But typically when they're swimming, that's kind of what you see. You know, just the top third of their head will be above the water. Their ears and their nose are always above the water. So they can breathe and hear. Actually, they can hear underwater probably just as well. But in their backs, you just see the very top of their backs. And usually their tails are under the water. They can use that tail as a rudder. That's one of the reasons they have that tail shape. They're not using it to really swim. They're using it to, to kind of change their directions and keep their balance in the water. But I find this one interesting because that tail is actually raised up a little bit, which you usually see right before they're going to do a tail slap. And this is probably something everybody knows about beavers. They do slap their tails on the water to, to sound an alarm to other beavers that something's not quite right. Great. Okay, so I think we're going to transition now to a drawing activity. And I want to say a couple things before we start. And I hope you've all had a chance to gather up a few basic materials. What you're going to need is a piece of paper, it could just be copy machine paper. If you have drawing paper, that's great too. Uh, the size, if you're gonna enter it in the contest, it's important that the size be eight and a half uh, on the short end by 11 on the long end inches. Eight and a half by 11 is the size of a, a piece of copy machine paper. The other, one of the other rules I wanna mention if you think you might wanna enter this contest is the paper has to be held horizontally. This is vertical, this is horizontal. It has to be held horizontally for this contest because, um, uh, it, well, be, it's a, it's a con conservation stamp contest and usually stamps are in that orientation. I'm guessing that's the reason why they have that rule. So get out your paper. I hope you also have a pencil you will need paper and pencil. And what we're going to do first is what I always recommend to people when they're starting to draw, and that is uh, look for the basic shapes. So we are going to bring up um, in a little bit, we're going to bring up, here we go, our, our beaver references. If you want to make it look bigger, maybe you are, have already done this, but if you look in the lower right-hand corner of the image, you'll see a little box with corners. If you click on that, it will increase the size of the image on your computer screen. So what I want you to do is choose one, any one, and hopefully you have several pieces of paper because the first, um, we're gonna do some quick sketches first just on scrap paper. So grab any piece of paper you have and choose one of these beavers and I want you to to then draw yourself a little box. I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about here. Um, you know, basically on your scrap paper, can you see that I've drawn a rectangle? There we go, a box. And then you're gonna do a quick sketch within that box. So let's go back to, you know, choose, like, I don't know which one you wanna choose, but I'm gonna choose one right in the middle near the bottom and you're going to go ahead and start to sketch. In this case, because the beaver's on a, on a log that's diagonally coming across, I'm going to draw that log, and then I'm going to draw my basic shapes. So on the one I'm looking at, the back part of the beaver, the closest shape I can think of is a circle. So I'm going to draw a circle. I'm then going to go, so, okay, what shape is the head? To me, it looks kind of like an oval that is pointed off to the right of the circular body. So I'm going to draw that oval. And then I'm going to, um, in this case, I can't really see the tail, but I see where the back leg comes down. And I'm going to draw that in. And maybe another little curved shape for the ears. 
sometimes, depending on your view, you can see both ears. Sometimes you can only see one ear. Look for the position of the eye. Look for the shape of the eye. Is the eye a perfect circle? Um, it looks that way in many of these photos. And where is it positioned? On the side of the head. Can you see the nose? What's the shape of the nose? Where is it relative to the eye? Can you see the front paws? You know, where is that shape? So again, I'm going to switch back to my showing you what I've done here. This, I've just done a quick circle over here. Whoops, wrong side. This side, and then the oval, and then here's the log. So hopefully you had a chance to, to practice with that a little bit. We're going to do another one. Let's go back to our references. I want you to draw another rectangle in the um, uh, horizontal format. All of these are, which is handy. None of these are vertical, so that's perfect. And I want you to choose a different one. And you're going to do the same thing. You're going to do a rough sketch showing the basic shapes. Okay, I'm going to choose a different one this time. You don't have to choose what I choose. You can choose something totally different. But again, do you see a circle? Do you see an oval or a triangle? What's the shape of the front leg coming down and the front paw, if you can see that? Where is the tail, if you can see that? Sketch in your basic shapes. Block them in. Again, once you've got the body shapes in there, look closely and notice where is the eye. I think on all of these, pretty much you can see the eye. Go ahead and put in the eye, the shape of the eye. Where is the ear relative to the eye? Go ahead and sketch in the ear. Can you see the other ear or just one ear? If you can see them both, sketch them both in. And then if there's any kind of Thing you like in the in the background let's not worry about that we're just focusing on the on the beaver right now can you see the nose can you see whiskers okay we're going to come back that hopefully that was a really fast quick sketch i'm going to show you the the bottom sketch here can you tell which one i was looking at the one with the beaver sitting on its tail yep way over on the right in the middle Okay, now we're going to go back to uh, my shape drawing of the first beaver I drew. And that one uh, is that one there. Okay, so you should all have a drawing that looks kind of like that. Yours is going to be different. But what I want you to do next is get out your good paper. And we're going to go back to that shape drawing for a moment first. We were drawing on scrap paper first. You can either turn your scrap paper over to have a clean side on the back or get a fresh piece of paper. But what I want to do now is we're going to go back to the references and we're going to spend a little more time for you to do your shape drawing. So yeah, fresh piece of paper. This one you're going to spend a little more time on. And I'm going to, as you're drawing, I'm going to talk to you. I want it to be fairly big. I want it to fill your paper nicely. In this case, your paper, you know, if you have an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, that's going to be the size that you submit to the contest. So when you draw your beaver, it really should be about the size of your hand. So I'm going to turn this around. If this is my, if this is my shape drawing, can you see how my hand is about that same size? You don't want it to take up the whole paper and you don't want it necessarily to go off the edges of the paper, but you want it to be big enough to see. Again, think about a stamp. If you're drawing a, something that's gonna eventually become a conservation stamp, remember it's gonna eventually be shrunk way down. And if your beaver starts out on this paper being tiny, think how small it would be if it got shrunk down to the size of a stamp. Okay, we're gonna go back to the references by now, I hope you've got your pencil and I hope you've got your good, clean piece of paper going and you're going to be drawing their shape drawing and putting it you know, approximately in the center of the paper because the beaver is the main subject of this drawing. 
you'll notice on these, not all of them are right in the center. Some are a little bit to the left. Some of them are a little bit to the right. Uh, but go ahead and choose one and do a spend a little more time this time on your shape drawing. And if you look, if you if your first attempt, you get something that looks weird or wrong, like let's say you wanted a circle, but it came out looking more like a triangle. That's what erasers are for. We have a artist in our museum's collection whose name is Robert Bateman. He's a Canadian artist and he says that in order to become a good artist, you need to make at least a thousand mistakes. So get started. So I'm just going to be quiet for a while so you can draw. If Jerry wants to say anything interesting about beavers while you draw, he can do that. But we're going to give you about, mm, let's say, five minutes to do this shape drawing and erase if needed. Make sure you include not only the basic body shape, but also the position of the eyes, the nose, the ears, the tail. Jerry, talk to us for a little bit. We're going to give them about four more minutes because uh, hopefully they got a good start on this while I was talking. Well, maybe sure, give them three, yeah. more, three more minutes. Okay. Yeah, so I'll talk. And if you're like me, you can't do two things at once. So if you're not listening to me and you're focusing on your drawing, that's okay. Um, Jane's talking about the body form, but you'll notice that a beaver's body form changes a lot when it's on land compared to when it's in the water. So when they're on land, they kind of hump their back up, they bend their, their backbone. And that's just to do what I talked about earlier, to put that center of gravity over their hind feet. But you'll notice when they're in the water, they're all stretched out, they're pretty flat. And so beavers, they really aren't as fat as they look, they just kind of look that way because they're, they're hunching their back. So if you want to draw a beaver in the water sometime, you would not want to draw that, that hump on their back, that ball shape. You would want it to be more flat, more linear. And then you can see on that, the beaver that's on the, the upper left there, it's walking on a dam. I don't know if you can tell that, but you're looking at the front part of that dam. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why beavers build dams. So I said that when beavers are, are walking on land, they're, they're kind of awkward. They don't move very fast, they're kind of clumsy. You can actually walk faster at a slow walk than a beaver can, can run at his top speed when they're on land. Now when they're in water, they move very quickly. They're really powerful and fast swimmers. So everything likes to eat a beaver. And they have a lot of predators, mountain lions, wolves, black bears, grizzly bears, coyotes. Beaver meat is very tasty. And so they have to have a way of avoiding being preyed upon. And the way beavers do that is to seek deep water. And on most streams that beavers live on, the water's not deep enough. So they build a dam to back that water up to create their own deep water habitat. They like to have about three foot of water depth. That's where they feel secure from predation. Um, but not just for predation, they also, they want deep water because they're actually storing their food that they're gonna eat all winter in that water, under that water. So a beaver will build a dam and then right behind that dam, usually close to where their lodge is, all fall during October, November, they'll be taking cottonwood, willow, aspen sticks, and they'll swim down with those sticks and they'll lodge them into the mud in the bottom of that stream. And that's called a food cache. There'll be a big pile of, of sticks that are at the bottom of that, that beaver pond. And so when winter comes and the top of that pond ice is over, the beavers really never have to come above that ice. They just swim from their lodge to that food cache and back to their lodge. And in that way, they're, they're never susceptible to predation. A wolf or a grizzly bear or a mountain lion is not going to even see them above the ice. That's great. Let's go back to um, the screen of, of me. <laughs> 
Thank you, Jerry. I'm so glad you talked about why they like deep water. I wasn't sure about that, but they're safest in deep water. Now that makes sense to me. So uh, after you do your initial shape drawing, then you're going to come in with your pencil and your eraser, and you're going to fine tune it. In other words, you can see that I've erased some of those circle lines that were formerly you know, making up the shape of the beaver's body. I've erased some of those lines. I've added some details like the toes and the claws that you didn't see before. Um, so the next step after you've got your basic shape drawing is to come back in and really fine tune it. In other words, it's maybe it's not a perfect circle or a perfect oval. Maybe it's more like a triangle. Do you see the difference um, between the initial shape drawing to how it ends up looking here? Sorry, there's an announcement being made at the museum. One sec. Okay. So, the, yeah, we're not thinking about the background just yet, but I want you to keep fine-tuning that shape, um, and we can go back right now to the images, because I want you to start sketching in the fur. I want you to sketch in, um, you know, whatever it's sitting on, make that a little clearer. Is it sitting on um, a rock? Is it sitting on ground? Is it sitting on a log? Um, if the fur looks wet, how can you make the fur look wet? Can you make it look like there's some lines going through the fur that look like the water is running off of the fur? Um, yeah, so this is probably in my, in, you know, the way I look at it, this is where you want to spend most of your time, getting the beaver correct. Because even though there is going to be a landscape and some habitat behind, that's not what this work of art is about. It's about the beaver and the background is just going to support the beaver. There's an artist in our collection, and I hope you're continuing to draw as I'm talking. There's an artist in our collection named Bob Kuhn, who he always does, the puts most of his time and energy into the animal. And then his background mostly becomes abstracted. In other words, it becomes suggested landscape, but not super detailed landscape. So he might include a band of color across the top of his rectangular picture space that is the sky. He might include another band of color that is the land. He might include another band of color below that that suggests water. And maybe he'll have a few little suggestive things in there for, you know, plants or sky or perhaps clouds, but he doesn't put a lot of time and energy into that. Again, because he doesn't want it to draw the viewer's eye away from the beaver. It's mostly about the animal. Um, so what, I'm going to do a quick time check here. Yeah, so what we're going to do next is we're going to go back to, oh, I want to say, you know, hopefully you have your own references because we don't really expect you to finish a drawing in our session today. We hope to get you started and get you excited about this. Even if you don't have these references, which actually we can tell you where to find these references, and Chris is going to post in the chat a link to the, um, the, uh, the contest brochure, which I'm going to hold up here now for just a moment. Chris is going to put that in the chat. So if you look that up, you will find the rules and regulations, the entry form for this contest, but you will also find these references. So if you want to continue on your own time working on uh, the beaver that you started, in our class today, you'll be able to find that exact same beaver references. But you know, I'm going to tell you, oftentimes when I'm doing a work of art, if it's an animal subject, I won't use only one reference. I will maybe use one reference for the position of the body. But maybe that reference doesn't show the, um, the beaver's paws very well. So I'll look up another reference for a really good close up of what the paws look like. And then maybe it doesn't show the ear. What does the ear look like? Maybe I'll have to look up a third reference to help me understand what the ear looks like. Likewise for the tail. So it's great to, um, to have references and oftentimes great to have more than one reference. Jerry, we have a 
comment that came in earlier, but um, I thought it might be a good opportunity to talk about where we can find beavers in Wyoming. Um, Wyoming Adventures on YouTube said, and I've watched beavers in the bighorns many times. Fun animal to watch. So where are some of the places throughout Wyoming that uh, people can expect to find beavers? Okay. So if you live in the Bighorn Basin or if you live on the Sheridan side of the Bighorn Mountains, the Bighorns are actually a good place on the North Tongue, which is where the Highway 14, 14A goes. Um, that's a great place to view beavers. There's um, quite a few beaver dams there. Um, I will say, though, that if you're going to try to observe beavers, you have to be a little bit of a night owl because beavers are they're nocturnal animals, which means their activity is mostly at night. But you will usually see them after the sun goes down in that dusk period, just before it gets too dark to see. That's actually the best time to observe beavers. But um, yeah, the, the North the North Tongue is a great place to see beavers, but really anywhere in Wyoming where you have what I call a wadeable stream, a stream that you can actually wade across, that's where you're going to find most beavers. You will find them in the larger river systems too, but usually it's hard to figure out where beavers are. But when you have a wadeable stream, they're almost always going to have a dam. And so you find find a beaver dam and then uh, set yourself up so that you can be there, you know, right before it gets dark. And you'll have the best chance of, of seeing beavers. Nice. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about habitat and background before we before we run out of time here. So if we could go to the line drawing of mine that shows a habitat background, Chris. That uh, And there's another one, that one, yes, <laughs> that shows the entire background. So I want you to see that the first thing I, I drew here was the beaver. It was about the size of my hand. It filled up a, a nice uh, percentage of the drawing, but not so much that it went off the paper. And then some, one of the next things you need to think about is, uh, you know, what's going to be the water source? We talked earlier about the fact that beavers are always near or on some water source, if not in it. So what I created here was like a, uh, what I was hoping to create here was like a stream running into a little bit of a lake and the beavers on the edge of the stream or on the edge of the lake. But off to the left side is where the stream runs into the lake. And I decided to put my body of water right behind the beaver. And then once you've decided where, what your water source is and where it's gonna go, the next thing I recommend is thinking about where does the water join the land? So if you look behind the beaver's back there, you can see um, where I've put some grass to show that the land is starting right there. And then what's behind that? Uh, that's my horizon. Of course, the horizon is where the sky and the land meet. And you could decide to have rolling hills. You could decide to have mountains. Um, I decided it was important for me, for my composition. I wanted a little bit of sky to show. You don't necessarily have to have sky showing. Um, it's your choice. And then in the foreground, it looked like, you know, from my, for my composition, and composition is just how you want to arrange things within the picture space. I decided in my composition that I wanted some flowers uh, that might grow alongside the stream in the foreground there, just to give it a little interest. That corner felt like it needed something. So when we talk about composition, it's like, how do you arrange the pieces of the puzzle? Is there something in the foreground? what's in the middle ground, what's in the background. So for my drawing here, the middle ground is the river running into the lake. The foreground or what's in the front of that is the wildflowers. And then the background is the mountains. Okay, now let's talk about the trees. I added those trees, which I kept it simple because again, I didn't want to have a tons of detail. If I had added lots of little branches and lots of little leaves, your eye would have gone right to the trees and not to the beaver. I wanted to remember the beaver is the main thing I want you to be looking at. So I kept everything in the background pretty simple. Um, the water is simple. The banks 
are simple. The trees are simple. They're supposed to be cottonwoods, by the way, or maybe aspens. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> the mountains are simple. They're not too crazy detailed. Um, the sun is simple. Everything is simple in the background. The background is to support the beaver. So if it's distracting from the beaver, something's wrong. I need to start erasing and simplifying if my background gets too complicated. Okay, now we're gonna talk, oh, you wanna jump in, Chris? Yeah, I just uh, wanted to say we have about five minutes left. Oh, but I also wanted to ask about um, when to start thinking about how you could incorporate color into your drawing. Right, let's switch to the color. That's a good question. Let's switch to the color one right now. So when you add color to your drawing, which by the way, if you want it to be black and white, I think that is acceptable for this contest. It could be just a pencil drawing. It could be a marker drawing. It could be, you know, ink or paint. It could be just black and white or shades of black and gray and white. But I decided I wanted to use color. I used colored pencil. The medium or the art material you use uh, is up to you, but, we, but things that are acceptable for this two-dimensional flat work of art would be pencil, colored pencil, maybe marker is fine, uh, paint, whether it's watercolor paint, poster paint, acrylic paint, that's all fine. If you use watercolor paint, you're gonna wanna use a heavier piece of paper than a copy machine paper. Copy machine paper is fine for colored pencil or for marker, but if you're planning to add paint, you should get some thicker paper. Watercolor paper is the best, of course, for watercolor. If you try to watercolor on a thin piece of paper, it's gonna wrinkle up as it gets wet. And that kind of is frustrating. So thicker paper for paints, but um, what, what about mixed media? Mixed media just means a variety of different art materials. So you could have watercolor paint in the background, for example let that dry, and then you could come over on top of that with colored pencil to do your details. That's perfectly acceptable too. So whatever materials you use, um, uh, whether it's paint or pencil, if we go back to, the, um, to my color drawing once again, I wanna give you a couple quick tips here. And that is if you're using colored pencil, notice how I have used um, in some areas, I've pressed really hard with the colored pencil, like the, the ripples in the water is a dark blue. I've pressed really hard. Other times I've used the side of my pencil and I'm just shading lightly. That allows you to get some things that are darker or more intense and some things that are lighter that fade into the background. I want you to look for just a moment at my trees. Notice how they're overlapping some trees are in front of other trees, other trees are behind. Notice what I did so that they weren't all the exact same blob of color shape. Uh, I didn't use the exact same color of green. I used some darker greens, some lighter greens. On some of them I pressed really hard to get really dark and others I pressed less hard to get a lighter shade of green. Same thing in the hills in the background. You can see that I used a lighter green for the one mountain or hillside and a darker green for the other. That's because I want you to be able to tell there's different layers going on here. Um, like what else do I want to point out? The sun uh, that you have. Oh, the reflection. Thank you. One of the photographic references we were looking at earlier, the one with the beaver sitting on its tail. Do you remember that one? It showed... Yeah, look at the water there. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Is the water always blue? Not in this case, the water appears yellowish orange with some green over there in the upper left-hand corner. That's because water will reflect the sky or whatever is on the bank of the river or the lake. So water, in this case, the water is reflecting green on some leaves of the trees on the bank. And it's also reflecting the sunset colors. I'm guessing this photo was taken at sunset. So if we go back to mine now, you can see I put a setting sun in here. Remember Jerry said they're really active in the evening as the sun is setting. So 
the sun is setting and can you see a little bit of that orangish yellow color being reflected in the water? Again, the blue, the blue water is also the blue of the sky as it gets late in the day. So remember the colors in the water is always gonna reflect what's happening in the sky. Okay, a couple other things before we run out of time. I wanna make sure you know that the contest does have a deadline. So if you're interested in that, I wanna make sure you know that your, your art has to be fin finished and submitted by March 31st. So it's coming up on us pretty fast here. So don't forget that. I also wanna mention, which we haven't mentioned yet, that for the contest, your work will be judged in different age groups. So in other words, if this is open to students in kindergarten through 12th grade, but kindergartners don't have to compete against 12th graders. You'll be happy to hear that. Uh, their age group, the youngest age group is kindergarten through second grade. So those kids will be judged together. Third through fifth grade is another age group. Sixth through eighth grade is another age group. And then ninth through 12th grade. So if you enter the contest, there is an entry form that you'll be filling out where it asks you which age group you are in, and you'll fill that out. You will make sure to include your name, uh, how we can reach you. Um, so do you wanna jump in, Chris, before we run out of time, just to talk a little bit more about how to enter this contest and how to send in your artwork, and then you can wrap it up for us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I have dropped a, an entry link into the chat. So once you have your uh, Beaver artwork complete, you can visit that link um, that I just included in the chat below. And once you click on that, it'll ask if you're a teacher, st a student. Um, this contest is only open to Wyoming students, the youth portion. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we also have a uh, contest for professional artists. Um, those paintings are also due um, on March 31st. So um, if you know a, um, a good professional artist, can encourage them to meet that deadline. Um, but uh, as Jane mentioned, there are several grade level categories and we have um, three cash prizes for each grade level category. So um, the first prize is $150, second is $100, and third is $50. So tell your friends, it, it could be a fun way to, um, to compete and increase your uh, artistic, or give you another opportunity to showcase your artistic expression. Um, and I think it's just kind of fun to look more closely at the beaver. I know um, even going through this, I'm noticing things about beavers that I, I didn't notice when I was just out and about and encountered them. Um, so those are the main things on how to enter. I also want to mention that we will be announcing the winners through another Facebook and YouTube live event similar to this, and that will be happening on April 28th. So stay tuned for details on that. That will be at 5.30 p.m. Mountain Time on the 28th. So um, tune in if you submitted artwork to see if you won. Um, and other than that, that is really all I have to share. Jane, um, I want to get pass it back to you and um is there anything going on at the national museum of wildlife art that people can experience between now and when we announce winners sure i'll mention really briefly that we always have our permanent collection up as well as some temporary exhibits that are maybe on loan or maybe they're just up for a for a shorter period of time. There's a great exhibit up right now on wolves. It's a photography exhibit by a photographer named Ronan Donovan. So that's one that is up through, in, through most of April. So you still have some time to get here to see that one. It takes up two whole galleries, really beautiful photographs of wolves in Yellowstone and also in Ellesmere Island, which is up in the Arctic Circle. The other thing I want to mention is we have a student art exhibit right now that is local Teton County student artwork created in their school art classes, kindergarten through 12th grade. Really fun to see 
Um, the art teachers picked a theme transformation this year. So all the artworks tie in with that theme transformation. I wanna add one more thing about art contests and that is if you enter the art contest and if you don't get chosen as a winner, it doesn't mean your artwork is not good. It's really hard because I've been a judge. I'm not a judge in this contest, but I have been a judge in some other kids' art contests. And it's so hard. And what you like is so, you know, varies from person to person. What I choose as a winner would be different from what Chris chooses as a winner would be different from what Jerry would choose as the winner. So a lot of good works of art never get chosen. Please know that if you get chosen, great, we're excited for you. But if you don't get chosen, your artwork is still really good. And we're glad that you are working and practicing as an artist and we hope you keep it up. So thank you, that's all I have to say. Yeah, thanks Jane. And um, as you mentioned, you know, part of the, the value of artwork uh, is the cultural value that we talked about. So even like with the totem pole, it might not have been a realistic beaver that would have won this um, right. contest, but it's displayed proudly in the uh, National Museum of Wildlife Arts. So you never know where your artwork could end up, but uh, at the very least, we'll be happy to show all the student submissions in our event on April 28th. Um, and Jerry, I wanna thank you for being a part of today's live event as well. Jerry will be one of the judges and he will be looking um, at the behavior of the beaver and um, some accuracy. So he'll be judging on that. And then we have a panel of judges that will be looking at things like composition and things like that. But we hope you enjoy the contest. Um, we're excited to offer those prizes and we can't see we can't wait to see what you submit. So thanks for watching and uh, feel free to share this with any other Wyoming students you know in those grade levels. Um, and like I said, we, we can't wait to see your artwork. So thanks for watching and take care. <laughs>